and twist them. Josh Mallerman's book doesn't necessarily provide any great details on the origin and backstory of these unseen mind-bending monsters. However, the original Bird Box movie did attempt to give some vague clues about these malevolent unseen monsters, and the 2023 spin-off Bird Box Barcelona throws in some more light. Naturally, I am going to talk about both movies and explore what they have to say. In this video, I will explore the possible origin of the unseen entities, who they are, what they actually look like, if they can be killed, and if not, if humans can find a cure for the menace. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. Who are they? Where did they come from? The origin and nature of the creatures remain shrouded in mystery. These mysterious entities first appeared in Romania, before gradually spreading to various regions across the globe, including Russia, Japan, the Korean Peninsula, the Middle East, Europe, Northern Africa, Peru and Colombia, and Southern Greenland. So you see their spread is not confined by the presence of water bodies, like the monsters from John Krasinski's Quiet Place franchise. The creature's arrival is almost always accompanied by a shadowy wind that rustles leaves as they pass. However, apart from this effect, these invisible Visible entities do not appear to possess any physical capabilities. I mean, they can't even enter enclosed spaces. The true motives and intentions of these creatures remain unknown. One character from the original film, Charlie, speculates that they may be demonic beings capable of assuming the form of an individual's worst fears. Nevertheless, this theory was not substantiated. The creatures have a profound psychological impact on human beings. Merely looking at them inflicts severe mental trauma on individuals, inducing a trance-like state that is characterized by the victim's eyes turning rather crystalline. This psychological distress compels the victims to commit suicide using any available means. They could throw themselves in front of cars and trains, out of windows and terraces, and if they're bound tightly to a chair, they would go as far as striking their head against hard objects, which is what happened with Gary in the 2018 film. Curiously, some people who already display signs of mental instability or clinical depression or extreme grief develop a peculiar reverence for the creatures, regarding them as beautiful. The interesting thing about these people is that they do not have the need to wear blindfolds because they do not become suicidal. You could say that being mentally unstable gives you some form of limited immunity against the mind-bending beings. These individuals often aid the monsters in hunting down other humans, either by persuading or forcing them to gaze upon the creatures. And if the victim resists beyond control, these crazy henchmen of doom kill them. Until now, there has been just one character who momentarily resisted the suicidal impulse. Tom managed to overcome the compulsion for a brief period, allowing him to eliminate another affected man and save Mallory is in Russia the thing that's making everybody crazy. It's here. It's here now. What? Can you just please... <laughs> what the bird box monsters actually looked like. So these creatures might be some kind of quantum beings that do not have a permanent physical form, let alone a physical form. They may not even have a permanent physical state. They are fluctuating and changing all the time, and once we see or hear them, they simply take the form based on our own minds. Different people may see them as different things. Some see them as aliens, while others see them as demons, and yet others may see them as their torturers or their gods. The creatures burrow into their victim's brain, taking the victim's beliefs and fears to twist them, and these deep-rooted feelings are then used to manipulate the victim. In Bird Box Barcelona, well, spoiler alert, a character named Octavio, who had a degree in physics, deduce that the creatures work on the principle of the observer's effect. In quantum mechanics, the observer's effect refers to the phenomenon where the act of observing or measuring a particle can actually affect its behavior. It suggests that the very act of observing a quantum system can change its state or properties. At the quantum level, particles like electrons can exist in multiple states or locations simultaneously, a concept known as superposition. However, However, when we attempt to measure or observe the particle, it collapses into a single state or location. You can equate it with something like Schrodinger's cat. So yeah, these creatures have no definite shape or form, and they are just the manifestation of a person's feelings and emotions. In the first movie, one of the crazy henchmen named Gary, played by Tom Hollander, puts on display the many sketches he had made of the monster. There were just so many of them, each more horrifying than the previous one. Now, I think the reason why Gary saw the creature in so many different forms was that he was mentally insane, so his unstable self was feeling different different things each time he saw the creature, and hence, his mind manifested the creature in different forms. It's just like Kevin Wendell Crumb's 20-something personalities would have perceived the creature in 20-something ways. In Bird Box Barcelona, people could hear the voices of their long-dead loved ones. On the other hand, if we talk about Sebastian, he had been affected by the sight, but just before that, he had seen his adolescent daughter commit suicide, and the event left his mind unhinged, played with eternal and immense grief. This is why the sight did not turn him suicidal. So Sebastian saw the monster as an angel, a seraph, the most 
most beautiful angel. This was because he and his wife had given a seraph pendant to their daughter Anna for her first communion. Funnily enough, the first Pert Box movie initially planned to show the creatures in the form they appeared to the characters. The version of the monster that was to appear to Sandra Bullock's Mallory was to look like a weird childlike entity. But thankfully enough, Ms. Bullock hated the idea and it was finally dropped. What kind of stuff can they do? Customized trauma? If what these creatures did to their victims was a dish, it would be a customized trauma recipe, with fear as per taste. These delusions often manifest as visions of loved ones who have passed away. For instance, one character named Douglas witnesses his deceased wife approaching a burning car while mentioning her mother, who had died a decade earlier. This, to each his own kind of experience, drives the sane people suicidal, and the insane people become servants of the monstrosity. In fact, the insane people become desperate to see the entity, as if it was substance to a junkie or a human brain to a zombie. Birds are not really immune. In the novel, the entities are referred to as the problem. As survivors grapple with finding ways to protect themselves from these creatures, they realize that birds can serve as early warning signs. Tom Hanks birds outside the house as a means of serving as lookouts and natural alarms, as the birds possess the ability to sense the presence of the problem. However, the birds of the novel are not immune to the creature's influence and eventually succumb to insanity. They become erratic and violent and kill each other. Later in the novel, as the protagonist Mallory and her children, boy and girl, approach their final destination, they witness numerous birds plummeting from the sky in a shocking cascade of lifeless bodies. This is in contrast to the film adaptation, which portrays the birds as merely reacting to the proximity of the creatures without undergoing a state of madness, shape-shifting. From the sketches we saw that Gary had drawn, it becomes evident that the entities can shape-shift to specific individuals, and if we are to believe that they have no definite form or state, this becomes even more plausible. Communication with victims While it is commonly accepted that the monsters in Bird Box do not possess the ability to communicate in a language comprehensible to humans, there are instances that challenge this notion. Potential victims do hear voices, but it is important to clarify that these voices do not originate from the monsters themselves. Instead, these are the voices voices of someone significant, that the victim has lost or, in the case of Jessica and Tom, someone they deeply fear losing. Interestingly, both Jessica and Tom have a strong attachment to Mallory and harbor a fear of losing her. Therefore, it is Mallory's voice that can be faintly heard speaking to them moments before their untimely deaths, despite the fact that she is still alive. The effect was so strong in the case of Sebastian that he could actually see his daughter. Who are those people who want you to see them? Are they heralds of the monster? At the end of Barcelona, the two survivors, Sophia and Claire, reach their destination, a castle, where they find an entire community living in peace. But there's more. Unlike the previous film, this place is more than a safe haven for the survivors. It also serves as a research facility, where the remaining members of the military and the government are trying to find cures. Here, the doctor taking Claire's blood tells her that there exist individuals who, following their exposure to the creatures, experience a corruption of the mind. Seers, that's what they are called. These affected individuals deviate from the common pattern of suicidal tendencies and instead engage in aggressive behavior, actively seeking out and coercing others to look at the monsters. Barcelona provides further elaboration on the motivations behind these individuals' assistance to the monsters. Sebastian offers insights into the psychological perspective, driving those who aid the creatures. Sebastian perceives the creatures as divine entities and believes that by exposing people to them, it is saving their souls. Notably, he even witnesses what he interprets as the departure of individuals' spirits from their bodies upon their demise. Sebastian's hallucinations of Anna, which represent the will of the monsters, fuel his conviction to save the people he encounters, promising a heavenly reunion when the time is right. However, as Sebastian's faith falters, he gradually realizes that the creatures are not divine beings. Consequently, his focus shifts towards protecting Sophia and Claire instead. Towards the end of the film, the military authorities suggest that encountering the creatures results in genetic alterations in the DNA, potentially explaining the obsession exhibited by individuals who survived their initial encounter. Is there a cure? In Barcelona, the possibility of a cure for the effects caused by the creatures is explored in the final few scenes. After the protagonist Claire and Sophia encounter a group of survivors who have established a self-sustaining community protected by the army, a doctor conducts an investigation on Claire to ensure she is not a seer. Claire tells the doctor that she was grateful for the sacrifice made by Sebastian, implying that a seer had a change of heart and it was because of him that she and Sophia survived. During the investigation, the doctor reveals that seers may possess a potential cure within their blood due to alterations in their DNA resulting from trauma or grief. The military aims to develop a vaccine using this discovery to counteract the effects of the creatures. It is suggested that the creatures themselves may inadvertently contribute to their own downfall by allowing seers to exist. The doctor explains that extreme stress can influence DNA and create significant changes. Sebastian's grief over the loss of his daughter represents an example of such extreme stress. The military's theory is that if all seers share a common epigenetic alteration, it could pave the way for 
developing immunity to the creatures. Experimental investigations are underway using rats, where an Nasir compound is administered, allowing the animals to perceive the creatures for a limited duration of 48 seconds before succumbing to suicidal tendencies. Yes, the military had somehow managed to capture one of these entities and was using it for experiments, but this poses another problem. They were keeping the monster in close vicinity of a substantial population, and it may go wrong. I mean, this is just the recipe for disaster. Anyway, considering that the ending of Bird Box Barcelona takes place several years before the conclusion of the original film starring Bullock, it is uncertain whether the military's experiments ultimately yield success. On the contrary, the outcome of their endeavors in developing a cure may not have reached the United States by the time depicted in the original film. How to kill the bird box monster? If not, how to survive? The possibility of effectively combating the creatures without risking one's eyesight is futile. However, given everyone has 10 times the luck Tom Cruise has in Mission Impossible movies, there is a chance. But we have to realize that it is also plausible that the survivors have little to no chance against the creatures, because all humans cannot survive blindfolded. Even blind people need some kind of help or another to get through life. Just imagine the difficulties in finding fresh water and cooking or finding food. And even if you somehow manage to survive without seeing you cannot make any noise because there are thousands of seers around you who want to force you into seeing the entities. But let's talk about the positives now. The creatures, while largely invisible, have been observed to exhibit physical characteristics and limitations. Their inability to pass through closed doors or walls suggests a tangible nature, supported by scenes in which the creatures part trees and can be touched. This physicality allows for the potential of trapping or hurting the creatures, and that's exactly what happened in the second movie. To devise a strategy, it is essential to estimate the creature's size. Based on observation, in a forest scene, it can be inferred that they reach a height of tall trees. However, we did see individuals jumping from roofs or reports of falling planes during the initial outbreak, which suggests that the creatures can fly. While it is known that the creatures are attracted to human presence and actively seek out individuals, the use of a bait becomes critical. Military volunteers, willing to sacrifice themselves for the greater good, could serve as effective bait. By restraining the volunteers securely and employing blindfolded guards, the risk of self-harm can be mitigated. One could also survive these creatures by creating a huge dome. The structure should have solid walls on all sides, with two doors on opposite ends. A powerful light source should be placed adjacent to one of the walls, enabling the observation of the creature's shadow. After the creature enters the dome, the restrained soldier, facing away from the door, can be turned to face the creature, while the soldier will experience suicidal thoughts. The inability to act on them ensures safety. Subsequently, the second door, connected to a double door system, similar to a clean room airlock, can be opened, and the soldier can be wheeled into the space between the doors. By using another light source, Source, the movement of the creature can be observed without experiencing harmful effects, so it will all be a game of shadows. Additionally, if there are enough resources to create a 3D version of the GPS, then it could be integrated with a VR device. This would allow the user to view the world as it is through the VR headset and navigate easily. But of course, there are several challenges to this as well. The world is constantly changing, trees would grow at an unprecedented rate. With no human interference, storms and hurricanes could change the very topography. But most importantly, there is no way to find so much infrastructure to build these things. I personally believe that you cannot really kill the monster, at least, not with the currently limited information we have on the creatures. But since one of them has been captured, we can maybe deal with it. On the other hand, the best way forward is the vaccine. We just recovered from the COVID pandemic, right? And if there is one lesson to be learned from there, it is that we didn't try to kill the virus by making medicines. The first objective was to create a vaccine. So, instead of finding a method to kill the creatures, the priority should be finding a vaccine or a cure. But that's just my opinion. Do you have anything else in mind? All possibilities as to who these creatures might be alien invaders. The creatures are extraterrestrial beings aiming to eradicate humanity by exploiting the vulnerabilities of the human mind. Friendly aliens, the creatures are benevolent aliens attempting to establish contact with humans, unaware of the detrimental effect their presence has on human sanity. Interdimensional beings, they originated from another dimension and were unintentionally transported to our reality. Demonic entities, in a biblical context, some speculate that the creatures embody demonic forces seeking to unleash chaos and torment. Prehistoric creatures, they could be ancient, long-extinct beings that have resurfaced in the modern world. Biological warfare or terrorism. This theory suggests that the creatures are the result of biological weapons developed for warfare purposes, causing insanity in their victims. Mass hysteria. The notion of mass panic induced by the mere suggestion of danger could be a possibility. Cthulhu mythos. Too far-fetched? Maybe. Well, that was all I had for my end. If you have got any suggestions or corrections, do feel free to let me know in the comments.